Good morning, Cross Point. Ugh, adjust my mic. Good morning. Would you stand up? We're going to sing this morning to start this worship service together. Uh, I love this song. It's the first song that we're going to sing, and it, it's a song that calls us all together. We've come from a lot of different places, both just from wherever your house is, but we also come from a lot of different places uh, in our past week. Some of you have come this morning with a lot of hurt and a lot of grief, and others of you have come with a lot of joy and uh, just thanksgiving, and so we want to just come together as God's children, and we want to just praise our risen King. So let's do that together this morning. supposed to do? Rejoice. rejoice, right? We rejoice as we clap. We rejoice as we sing. Amen. It's good to be together with you in worship this morning. Go ahead and have a seat. I have a number of announcements I want to uh, let you know about. First, if you're a, a visitor here at Cross Point, we want to extend a special welcome to you this morning. And in the chairs uh, in front of you, in the pockets, there is a connection card. Uh, and we want to invite you to 
fill that out and drop it in the offering bag when it comes around in a little while. Uh, if you don't get it in there, that's okay, don't worry. Uh, there will be people standing at the doors on your way out. You can just hand it to an usher or to an elder. And that allows us to know that you're here. Uh, we want to rejoice uh, with you uh, and your presence with us. And so please use this connection card. Also use it for your prayer requests or items of praise. Number of uh, announcements and things coming up that we want to let you know about. And the first is Men's Adventure Weekend. Men, if you, yeah, that's right, Chris. If you love to be in God's beautiful creation, the most beautiful part of God's creation is in Southern California in the Sierras, not Colorado, Tim. But in the Sierras of Ca Southern California, uh, we have a great time. It's May 16 to 19. That's a Thursday through a Sunday morning. Um, if you can't come up on Thursday, that's okay. Come up on Friday. If you can't come up on Friday, come up on Saturday. But it is a great time of incredible fellowship, which you're going to hear about in the message this morning. The fellowship of the body. Um, also, a uh, great time of just activities. If you like to hike or bike or fish uh, or golf or hang around the camp and just read a good book, uh, you would love Men's Adventure. And so, uh, men, make sure you see uh, the, the committee. They're out in the, in the courtyard after the service at a table and get signed up, and uh, also incredible times of worship in the evening. Next, we have Pentecost Sunday, right? Pentecost is when we as a church celebrate the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church, and so this year, Pentecost is on May 19, and uh, we have something incredible planned for that morning. We're going to be joining uh, in worship with Praise Tabernacle and with our uh, Cross Point Chinese Church. That's going to be here, one service, okay? Put it on your calendars now. One service, 10 o'clock on May 19, and then uh, plan on staying and just uh, having a great time of fellowship. Uh, we're going to have a lunch at noon that day with those churches as well. And if you're a man and you're thinking, well, I don't want to miss that, you won't miss that. We're going to have the same thing up at um, Men's Adventure Weekend. We're going to have guys from Praise Tabernacle there. We're going to have guys from our Chinese church there and guys from a, another Christian Reformed Church in Bellflower, Bethany Christian Reformed Church. So we'll have our own Pentecost service up there, and we know where the good food's at, right, guys? <laughs> right? We just smell the bacon, follow the smell of bacon, and you'll find Men's Adventure Weekend. Uh, next, coffee. Join us for coffee. Some of you already experienced this. We have moved our coffee from out that way to right outside of the Welcome Center in the courtyard and, and uh, just uh, uh, doing a little bit of revamping in our welcome ministry, and this is a part of that. So uh, let your, follow your nose and, and follow the smell of coffee after the second service. It'll be right through these doors and to the right uh, just head west and you'll, you'll find the coffee and join us for that after the service, a good time of fellowship. And then uh, Jane, Jane, are you here this morning? There's Jane. She's got her hand up. Uh, we have been blessed to be able to partner with Jane a number of times uh, financially. Uh, Jane goes to Kenya and she has a, a heart for the widows of Kenya and to help them earn a sustainable income, we have been able to partner to build those greenhouses and uh, those greenhouses provide income for the widows. Um, and so uh, Jane is going back again and this time uh, there, we need a well, right Jane? A water pump, okay, a water pump to get water from a river to the greenhouses because of drought. And so if you are interested in coming alongside Jane, um, and you see Michelle there, she went the last time. If you're interested in coming alongside Jane and supporting that financially, see you. Jane, will you be out at a table after the service again in the courtyard? So uh, find your way over there and, uh, and get some more information about that. And then last, uh, next week Sunday after the second service, we will be having our Covenant Partners class. Um, and so if you uh, are new to Crosspoint and you're interested in learning more about who we are and, and the vision that God has given us as a local church, um, or if you uh, want to know more about what it means to be a follower of Christ, if you've never been baptized as a believer, uh, any, any of those things, then join us next week Sunday after the second service. So it'll probably start around 1215. We'll serve you lunch. We'll have child care for you. Uh, but it's a great opportunity to hear what God is doing in our midst and for us as leaders to hear what God is doing in your lives. And so uh, next week, Sunday, um, after the second service.
So a lot of things going on, a lot of things to rejoice in, amen? And so let's uh, continue rejoicing as a body by standing up and uh, stepping into the aisleways. Greet those around you. Uh, welcome them here to worship at Cross Point. Thank you.
thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount i'm fixed upon it mount of thy love you so much father father god we we are prone to wander god every day every week god we we follow other things beside you god and you grab us and you take hold of our hearts god and you bring us to you father thank you for that love thank you for being a god that never leaves us never forsakes us in times of sorrow in times of rejoicing God, you are so holy and you are so awesome. And you, Father God, you are sovereign. 
You're sovereign over our entire lives. You're sovereign over all of your creation, God. God, when we stop and think about how huge you really are, God, it is so humbling to think that you would look down on us sinners and that you would love us, God. Father, we just graciously accept that with a huge heart of thanks, God. And we want to respond to that, God, through song, through speaking to you, God. We want to respond through just singing with our hearts, God. We want to respond through, Father, just taking in your word. Father, just accepting your Holy Spirit, God. And we invite you, God, to just grab hold of us individually, grab hold of our hearts as a church, God. Just change us, transform us, God. We want to be like your son. We want to be more like Jesus. So we pray, Father, that you would do that. And we thank you so much for your awesome power, God. We love you so much, God. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue worshiping through the giving of our offering and uh, through singing.
seated. Just listen to these words from David. Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O cross point, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Amen. And you think of that picture of David cries out in Psalm 131. I, I don't try to figure it out. He says, I can't understand all the stuff going on around me. And I give up. And we live, you know, in a day where, wow, there's so much going on. And this week, talking to many of you in struggles and <laughs> health issues and marriage issues and forgiveness issues and addiction issues. And uh, David really sums up our relationship to God should be like a child, like a little child, that all that child can do is say, Mommy, I need you, right? Like a weaned child uh, should our hearts be. And so this morning as we pray, I, what I want you to do as our prayer time is just to do this. Just raise your arms with me to your Father God, okay? And whatever you're struggling with and whatever you're hurting and whatever's going on in your life, you just reach out your arms to your Father. Lord, we come to you as your children. And Father God, you know our needs and you know our hearts and you know our struggles. You know the sin that, that we just can't get over, God. You know the bitterness. You know the anger, God. You know our health issue. You know our marriage issue. God, you know our financial issue. You know what's going on at work. You know what's going on right now at school. You know what's going on with our friends. God, we just surrendered. Some of us, maybe for the first time, we're coming, and we don't even know you as Lord and Savior. And we're coming, and we're just reaching out our hands and saying, God, would you save us? Would you show us your son, Jesus Christ? Would you forgive us? Would you wash us? Would you, would you make us your child? God, we don't know what else to do. We, we can't figure life out, but we are lifting our arms to you, Father. Would you hug us? Would you embrace us? Would you draw us this morning to yourself? Lord, receive the prayers of your children as they cry out to you like a weaned child in its mother's arms. We come, and all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. 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 We've been uh, looking at the book of Job, and uh, we'll look next week too. Um, but if you have your Bibles and you can find Job chapter 42, we remember the story how uh, Satan and God are kind of dueling, and God shows um, uh, Satan, he says, look at my servant Job, he's blameless, he's righteous, he's a good man, and and that begins this contest where Job says, well, if you take all the goodness away, he's going to curse you. And round one, God takes, lets the enemy come and goodness is taken away and horrific things happen. But Job still worships God. And then round two, uh, the enemy is allowed to touch his skin, touch his health. And, and then uh, Job just battles. He battles with these friends. He battles with God. Then he has this incredible encounter with God. And then we see the climax of that encounter in Job 42, where he really lifts his arm on the air and says, I surrender, God, to your sovereignty, to your lordship. I, I don't understand. Job becomes like a wean child right at this point. And this is when God is at his best, when we're children humble before a glorious king that we sang about before our father Abba in heaven. And so we're going to begin reading. If you have it, let's stand um, from Job 42. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted or ruined or changed. You ask, who is that that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. And Job's response, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself, and I what? I repent. 
in dust and ashes. He humbles himself. He becomes like that weaned child. Now notice how God acts out of this. Verse 7, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Tiamite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job, sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly, or we could translate that stupidity or your sin. You have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Ilphaz the Tiamite and Bilidad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite did what the Lord told them, and the Lord what? Accepted, Job. Accepted Job's prayer. Now notice verse 10, the transition. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again. He gave them how much more? Twice Twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone, notice this, everyone who had known him before came and what did they do together? They ate with him in his house They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. Father, we pray that you would uh, reveal your word, speak to us in my weakness, in my sinfulness, overcome that with your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. It has been really a blessing to hear some of your mission statements as I've challenged you to, you know, God has for each of you a mission statement. And I I shared with you mine back when I came back from sabbatical is um, to live into the fullness of my sonship or if you're a lady, daughtership um, in order to bring glory to God, my Father, in everything I do and simplify it. I just want to be somebody overflowing The glory of God just comes into my brokenness and my weakness and somehow through all those cracks and the broken places in my life, he'll spill out his love and his compassion and his mercy. And uh, so we look at Job and we see that happening um, to Job as well. And as we review a little bit, remember the, the first message from Job, we talked about Job forgiving God or translated that Job releasing God, God being let off the hook And how Job just said, I surrender to your sovereignty. And when God works in our lives, he wants us to be like this. He says, you know, I I want you to just be surrendered people. And Job doesn't understand what God's doing, doesn't understand that Satan's involved in this, um, doesn't understand that God and Satan are kind of dueling and having this dueling match going on, but, but he does this. He says, okay, God, I, I don't understand it. I surrender, I repent, I humble my heart, and I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to trust you with my life, even though it doesn't make sense. And then after that, Job is called, uh, God sets up this divine appointment, and Job is called to forgive his friends, to pray over them. Say, Lord, forgive them. I'm going to intercede. I'm going to be like Jesus, and I'm, I'm going to intercede for them. I'm going to be a, a high priest, and I'm going to accept their, their sacrifice, and I'm going to bless them and forgive them and pray, God, you bless them. And uh, so God uses that, and God comes into that. And, and that kind of leads us to where we're at um, this morning. Um, and before I get there, and, and just reminded of this when we talk about forgiving others, um, a couple of people this week that I've met with on the issues of forgiveness, um, this one person in particular for 30 years came to my office this week and said, you know, Pastor Tim, for 30 years I've been beating myself up. Grew, grew up in the church, knew the cross, accepted Christ, but did something really I'm ashamed of, and I really don't believe God has forgiven me. Um, It's too bad. It's too ugly. And so she's been in this church for many years, just sits there every Sunday, and says, I don't don't deserve God's grace. 
And in fact, I, I wish God would punish me. That's what I want. God, just, just punish me because that maybe will help my guilt go away. And we talked for quite a while about, you know, God has already forgiven you. When you cried out to him 30 years ago, God had already forgiven you. God had already uh, taken your sins away. The enemy's there to lie. The enemy's job is to, to come in and to bring shame. That's not God. God doesn't bring shame. Uh, that's the enemy. Um, and then again in prayer uh, this Wednesday, just hearing a great testimony too about, you know, forgiving yourself, just being able to forgive yourself. So if you're here this morning, not only do we have to forgive others, but, you know, if you're struggling with yourself, just receive grace. Receive a Savior who loves you, and all you have to do is confess that, and he just washes all your sins away. As far as the east is from the west, he remembers them no more. Um, amen? Amen. Um, but then it's like we come to this verse 10, and it's like a downpour of heaven. The windows of heaven are just opened up, and the floodwaters of God's grace come upon Job. The, the floodgates are open. I, and I, I have to work this in. I had to do it in the first service, but I have to work in this illustration um, because one of my things that in, in my vision and mission statement is uh, to laugh more, okay? I just want to laugh more. So Friday night, um, uh, <laughs> my in-laws had just taken us out for our family. They're in town from the great state of Michigan where it's always cold, always winter, never summer. And um, they're here, and we had a great time and uh, went out to dinner and, you know, getting ready for bed. Everybody's tired. We had a, a big meal. So we're just thinking about getting ready for bed. And there's a knock on the door. Our dog goes crazy um, late at night. And so it's uh, our next door neighbor's father who stays with them. His name's Louis. He's from France originally. So I can't always understand him. But I understood he was in a panic. And he says, my house, there's flooding, there's water. Can you come shut off the water? Help me shut off the water. So I go over there, go and to the, the bathroom and water's coming out and getting all over the floor. He was trying to work on it um, while his uh, son and daughter-in-law are, are, are working. So he was, they work really late. They're car dealers. And so he was there trying to fix it, broke something. Water's coming out. And we're trying to figure out how do we shut off the water when there's valves, you know, outside the house. They, we turn those. That didn't work. So you go to the street, right? And in the street, there's these, these valves there. And, and I can't figure out quite how to shut it off, and I don't want to break anything, so go back into the house, get bigger buckets, run into my house, get buckets, get Patty comes with towels, and then my father-in-law finally, you know, after several long minutes, um, comes over and asks if he could help. And, um, you know, he's a principal, I'm a pastor, we're not plumbers, so that guy is in trouble. <laughs> So we go to the street, and finally says, Tim, I see arrows. We got to turn it this way. And we got, we didn't have the right tool, but we got something, and we eventually kind of turned it halfway, not all the way, so water's still coming out. And he says, you know, I think we got to turn it more. So he gets down there at whatever age you are, still strong and vivacious, and he's able to turn it and shut off. There are two valves. We shut off the valves and go back inside. The water is turned off. Praise the Lord, right? Um, so we, we are feeling really good about being a pastor and being a principal, <laughs> uh, that we had accomplished this. And then we go back out, and the other neighbor comes out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and um, his wife is in the middle of taking a shower. <laughs> Shampoo in her hair. And he says, do you know why our water's turned off? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, it's a good way to meet neighbors, good way to do evangelism. Just, just shut off your neighbor's water. Um, they'll come out. Uh, I went and hid. <laughs> I let my father-in-law deal with it. Uh, uh, so anyway, 
we turned her water back on. So she was able to finish showering. Um, so where was I? Um, yeah, anyway, we, in a long story, kind of helped out some more. And, uh, but it, it made me think, Saturday I came here and was working on my sermon. I just start laughing again. I just laughing and, and, and thinking about, you know, if the water source is turned off, there's nothing you can do. They can turn, o- turn on every faucet in the house, but when the water source is turned off, no water's going to flow. And, and for Job, the same thing happened. God turned off the rivers coming down from the presence of God in heaven. He, he turned it off. And all that was there was darkness. And, and some of the, the mystic writers of another century used to call this the dark night of the soul where there seems to be no blessings from the Lord. And Job came into this dark night of the soul. The faucets of heaven turned off. There's nothing he could do. He was in suffering. He was in pain. He cried out to God. And finally God listens. And he has this interview with God in this majestic, glorious presence of God that he encounters that transforms him. And then in this verse 10, the fountains are opened. And, and notice right when it happens, verse 10. After Job had, what? Prayed. Prayed. And, and the fountains open, and the key is, the first key is really forgiveness. When, when Job prayed, it says, after Job had prayed... And so forgiveness is really that key. Forgiveness is, is saying, okay, God, I, I don't understand, but I've released you. I've released the friends. And God chooses sovereignly in verse 10 to say, okay, Job, you've honored me. You've been obedient. And Job has grown through suffering. That's what suffering does. Some of the greatest people in Scripture and the saints of Scripture, they have been molded in suffering. If we go back to to Job chapter 1 verse 5, Job is praying and asking forgiveness for his kids before God. He's acting like a priest for his household because his kids had a party. He worried that they sinned while they were partying. And so Job gets up in the morning, gets sacrifices, prays, asks God to forgive and bless his kids. Now we come to the very end of Job. And now Job is not just praying for his kids like he did in Job 1. Now he's praying for these three friends that have, uh, you know, discouraged him and kind of questioned him and judged him saying, you must be an awful sinner, Job, because God is punishing you so much. And Job, filled with the presence of God, is able through the Spirit to forgive his enemies, how Job has grown through suffering. And and I think of Jesus. It says in Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verse 8, um, through suffering, Jesus learned obedience. Through pain, and some of you are going through pain, and you're going, God, why is this happening in my life? Jesus went through great suffering and and he learned to obey the greatest, we said last week, the greatest act of obedience when Christ was on the cross and he cried out, Father, forgive them. Just like Job, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're saying. They do not know what they're doing. And that was the key to release God's grace from heaven to us. And now we see this in Job, same thing. He is just being like Christ And as Christ released us on the cross and forgave us of our sins on the cross, and as Job is interceding for his friends and forgives them, then the grace of God begins to flow down again. The heavens open, the floodgates come out, and then we see, we read on, the Father just brings blessing. And it it says, after he prayed, the Lord made him prosperous. Nobody else but the Lord prosperous again and notice this and gave him how much more twice Twice as much as he had before and we'll look next week at verses 12 and the end of the chapter but notice it says the Lord blessed the later part of Job's life more than the first he had 14,000 sheep chapter 1 he only had 7,000 
6,000 camels, only 3,000 in chapter 1. And God just doubled everything and then brought back seven sons and seven daughters. And so the father just blesses. Now I wonder if God doesn't decide to bless us like he just blessed Job. What would have Job done if God didn't bless him? And I, and I have a pretty good indication because of earlier in chapter 42, Job would have kept surrendering to God. Because remember chapter 1 when the first trial came, he says, naked into the world I've come, naked I will depart. The Lord gives, the Lord what? Takes away, but what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I believe that Job, even if God would not have restored half or uh, uh, double portion, he would have still said, okay, God, I have seen you. I know you. In Job 19, Job makes this prophetic, prophetic declaration. I think around verse 24, 25, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. He says this in the middle of the suffering. I know that my Redeemer lives. And, and when this flesh gives way, I'm going to see him face to face with my eyes. And I'm going to still see him. And, and that is my, Job says, my desire is to know God. That's all I want. Suffering led Job to a place that all he really wants is to know God. The Apostle Paul said the same thing in, in Philippians chapter 3. All I want to know is who? Jesus Christ and him crucified and raised from the dead. And then he goes in chapter 4 and he says, you know, I have learned the secret to be content in any and every situation, whether I'm well fed or hungry, whether I'm healthy or sick, no matter what, I have learned the secret to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so I believe Job would have made that declaration anyway because he's learned the secret of being content. He's seen the risen Savior. And so God blesses him, and, and then we read on. Now we, just what we want to spend just a few minutes this morning, this authentic fellowship. As God opens the floodgates, there's this powerful fellowship that happens. Verse 11, all his brothers and sisters. When Job suffered, and also in Job 19, when he suffered, he says, my brothers departed. Everyone who knew me took off. And that reminds me of Jesus too. You know, when Jesus started to suffer, what did the people do? When he hit his Big Mac suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happened with the disciples? They ran. Peter found his way back, you know, to uh, where Jesus was being tried by Caiaphas, and, and, and then he does what? He denies him three times, and Jesus is left alone. Job was left alone in his suffering, and it says, Job 19, all his brothers, all the people left him. Now look, all his brothers and sisters, and everyone who has known him before, and Job would have been well known in his community. They came, they ate with him in his house. And so there's this authentic fellowship happening and the focus of that fellowship is Job. See, Job was praying for these friends and they came to him and and Job starts praying, and they're offering sacrifices. They, they offer these seven bulls and rams, and there's blood, and there's smoke, and the community sees the blood and the smoke, and then they see poor old Job with all the sores and all the pain, and he's, he's doing this, and he's praying for these guys, and he's blessing them, and he's praying the Lord's blessing over, and he's forgiving them, and the people in the community are going, what on earth is happening? Job, with all these plagues that have come upon him, now he's standing in a place still suffering and he's blessing. And the community comes together. And what has happened to Job? How could anyone do what Job has done? And so the focus of this authentic fellowship around the suffering of Jesus Christ. And notice what they did in Job's home. What did they do? They all came to Job's house. You know, I, I don't think that would be right. You know, can't Job go to somebody else's house? I mean, he suffered so much. But they all come to Job's house. What do they do at Job's house? They eat. Now, if you think Hebrew or you think uh, Near Eastern, the people you eat with 
are people you are reconciled to. You would never eat with your enemy, right? You, you never in the Middle Eastern culture. You only eat with people you are reconciled to. And, and oftentimes the meal was a form of bringing reconciliation. So they come together around Job's brokenness and they come together around a meal. What does that point to in the New Testament? The supper. I, I got all excited about this when talking to Brian because, you know, in the supper we see the brokenness of Jesus. That's why it is so powerful next week when we, we come together here. We come to the broken table. And so Job, they, they come to the table in Job's brokenness. They break bread and there's reconciliation that happens. We can only have relationship with God and others really through the suffering of Jesus Christ. That's why we can go to any other church, and I went to so many churches on sabbatical, but I could feel like I'm brothers and a uh, brother to these people and their sisters and brothers to me because we share in the cross of Jesus Christ. And we break bread around Christ. Christ unites us in Christ's brokenness, in his death. And then I think of that story on the, the two on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus just pops in. You remember, I love this story. And they're, they're talking about, you know, Jesus dying, and the, the, some say he's raised, and here comes Jesus, and he shows up. He, he goes over the whole prophets and the, the Psalms and the writings and begins to open their minds to the Scripture that the Messiah must suffer and die. They didn't get that yet. They thought Messiah would be strong and powerful and mighty. And no, 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 Jesus, the, 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 the Messiah is a suffering servant. Then they go into the house, and what do they do in the house? Jesus does what? Breaks the bread. And I think the moment that Jesus broke the bread, they saw his hands, and they saw they were pierced. And then, they, then we read that Jesus takes off, and they, he says, what are our hearts burning within us? They had this conversion experience. It all came together. The whole Bible came together on a suffering servant who was wounded and raised from the dead. And now they're breaking bread together and they're having authentic community with Jesus. And what do they do? They run back as fast as they can back to Jerusalem, back to the disciples and say, he's alive. They, they, they form authentic community around a suffering Savior and and notice they come together, and the brothers and sisters and the community come together, and they do three things. They, they comfort Job. Um, they, they come in and they say, you know, we're going to comfort you, console you. And then they declare, you know, the Lord's done this to Job. Three things go on there. And they're coming into an authentic relationship. When I got back from sabbatical, um, some boxes were in my office that I don't know where they found them, but when we moved out here from our last church, I put some boxes someplace, and, um, and so they were there in, in my office. So I'm going through it, and, you know, I have the old floppy disk. You guys who are old as me, you remember what a floppy disk is? You know, I had all my sermons on these floppy disks, so I just tossed those in the trash, tossed other things. But I, but I came across this mask. And when I was at uh, my former uh, church, or one of the churches that I served, um, about two weeks after I was there, a lady walked into my office, literally, wearing a mask. And I go, oh man, what am I in for? <laughs> and so we're talking, and literally, she is, while we're talking in my office, she's wearing this mask. And I'm trying not to laugh, and I go, okay, what's... And then she says, she gets real serious, and she says, I, I wore this mask today, and I wore it into your office because, um, Pastor Tim, uh, we in this community and in this church, we've, we've kind of been behind mask. You know, we come to church, our kids look great. Man, they are dressed up. They look great. People ask us how we're doing. We say we're doing great. Business is great. Marriage is great. Kids are great. Everything's great. Live in a great community. And, and then she, she says, Pastor Tim, uh, I think God sent you here, and would you help us take off the mask? Wow. And then she just she took off the mask. She says, you know, we need to take off our mask 
in our church and in our community to be real, to be authentic. And this is what's going on. They're taking off, their, they're coming to Job. The word comforted there. Interesting, I looked it up and how many times it's used in the Hebrew. Several places in the Hebrew, the word comfort is the word repent. So I think one of the things that happened when they came to Job and they ate with Job and they heard the story of Job, God convicted their hearts. They were judging Job. They ran from Job, believing Job was cursed. They're thinking God is bringing justice on Job. And they come back and they realize something supernatural has gone on. And Job is forgiven. And Job is blessed. And they come to Job and they come with humble hearts. Saying, Job, would you forgive us? We've sinned against you. We repent. We want to know the God you know. And so revival's going on, and, and so the, one of the ways they comforted him was by repenting, and, and the word co- um, uh, comfort, and then the, the, the word, what's the next word? Consoled. And, and that word can be translated lament. And so they come, and they experience Job, and they repent of, of questioning and judging, and God begins to do a work in their heart, and then the word consoled, they, they begin to cry, and they begin to weep. They, they come into the suffering of Job. They enter into his pain. They lament. They, they cry out. They suffer. The body of Christ is, is really glorious when we come together in our brokenness. Brian and I were in an emergency room this week, and, you know, there were tears in that room, and there were prayers in that room, and there were people crying out to God in the waiting room, and in the midst of suffering, and then God began to do some miracles in the, in the midst of that incredible scene. But, but we lament, we join, we, we come along uh, with each other. And, and, and we're not good at that in our flesh. We don't like... Losers. We like winners in our culture, don't we? That's a Western culture we live in. We like winners. So when the Lakers were doing great, right? The glory days, Magic Johnson and Kareem. I even liked the Lakers back then. And when they win championships, I mean, you know, everybody's on the bandwagon. Who are the people cheering for now? Lakers or Clippers? Clippers, Clippers right? Now we're not sure about the Clippers anymore. But that's our society. We like the winners. We like churches that are big and have big buildings and big programs and popular worship teams and pastors. That, that's the world we, we live in. We want to, you know, the, those people, when things are great, we want to join that. The Bible is so different. Brian taught that when he taught the Sermon on the Mount. It's upside down. It, it all starts right here. And so we come, and we come to a suffering Savior, and we need to learn those psalms of lament and grief and cry out, and they came, and they repented, and they lamented at their sin, and they joined in with Job's suffering. And then they did something really interesting. They acknowledged with Job that God was sovereign over his suffering. You notice how that verse ends? They acknowledged, and they said, we know God, the Lord, Yahweh brought this suffering to Job. Did you you catch that in the word? So Job acknowledges God's sovereignty in the beginning of chapter 42. God, you're in complete control. You're, You're sovereign over all my suffering. And then he tells the story of seeing the glory of God surrendering and God showed up in all his divine wisdom and all his divine power. And Job surrenders to the sovereignty of God, and now he's teaching them, and they acknowledge God. This is God's deal. This wasn't Job's sin, that God, you are in control. When the church begins to understand, and I've said this again, and I'll say it again, when the church begins to understand the sovereignty of God, that your God is king. We sang about it this morning. Your God is king. Your God is sovereign. Your God reigns over everything. Now, now not only Job has acknowledged the sovereignty of God, these people are acknowledging the sovereignty of God. And, and one of you said to me, shared with me last week, you know, God brought you here to teach you about the sovereignty of God. That, that made my heart just leap. 
Because you, you, you maybe tried to do it on your own and, and you're taught that, man, if you had enough faith, God would move and God would heal and God would restore. And sometimes God says, no, I'm not going to heal. No, I'm not going to restore. And then you feel, man, it must be my faith. It must be I'm weak. It, it must be I'm frail. And all God wants you to do is say, God, I just surrender. I do not understand. Like a weaned child, I lift my arms before you and I trust you. The whole community is doing that. When revival comes, and, and we're seeing God do some amazing things here, but when revival comes, two things you will see. Sovereignty of God will be brought to the forefront again. That there is only one sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords who reigns over every square inch of the world. Who reigns over Republicans and Democrats alike. He is king, he is over them, amen? Amen. And he's over our government. He's over the world. He's, he's over dictators. He is king. Revelate, we were talking with the women in, in Beth Moore Bible study. We were talking about Revelation chapter 5 where here's the lion and the lamb. He reigns and he rules. So when revival comes, we understand the sovereignty of God. And second, secondly, the total dependence on the Holy Spirit. That we know we can't do anything. It's all the spirit of the living God. And we become a people that cry out and pray, God, this is only you. Only you can change your heart. Only you can bring somebody's salvation. Only you can direct my path for your glory and for your honor. God, you're sovereign and I need your Holy Spirit because I cannot do this. Every revival and going back to the book of Acts, those two things, sovereignty of God, total dependence on the Holy Spirit. The community in Job is coming to understand God's sovereign. We can't, God can. Amen? Amen. The fruit of that, notice the fruit of that, worship. When we uh, come into authentic community around Jesus Christ and the cross and his death and his resurrection, and we have authentic relationship where we, we come together as the body of Christ, we're sinful. You know, I think of men's adventure, just, just a quick testimony about that. I remember Brian was leading a night last year, and I was in a group, and just listening to guys get honest and real and confession of sin. That's, that's authentic community. We want to be a church that, that, that we're living in authentic community, that there's no mask. We're broken, sinful people and even though we dress our kids and they may look really good, you know, on the inside, we're all battling, we're all struggling. You know, even though we strive, you know, our, our kids, we, you know, they get A's or they're great athletes or they're great academics or, you know, we still got junk, amen. And we, we try to hide it. We want to be an authentic community that's focused on a suffering Savior and we're a suffering community and we repent of our sins. We come together. We were a lament as a community. We're sinful. We need the grace of God. And God, you're sovereign. When we do that, the fruit of that is worship. How do I know they worship here? Gives it away is when they left Job's house, what did they do? They gave their money. They gave their money. You know, how did God rebuild all his cattle and all? It started in this authentic community. God didn't just give him 14,000 cattle overnight. He gave him rings and silver. And then Job would invest that and buy some cattle. And God worked through community to restore Job. God used his authentic community and the love of God entered that community. And they worked together and they gave Job their tithes and offerings. Isn't that amazing? amazing. Uh, you, know, they, you know, when we don't worship, it really often shows up in our pocketbook, doesn't it? When, when I don't trust in the sovereignty of God, guess what? I don't trust to give God my money. When I don't trust in the sovereignty of God, I hang on. But when, when the Holy Spirit is moving, we're in authentic community, and when that community has need, we give. And, you know, Jane should be able to go, um, I think Joan's going uh, to Kenya this week, and that pump should be paid for, $3,100, right? Um, we, jo, Jane should go, and we should help those widows and orphans because that's a need. They need to eat. And we're a part of the body of Christ, and so we, we need to come alongside. When the, the kids went to the beautiful gate, and they had to raise tons of money, and I, as I was gone and I heard the stories, you guys gave because there was need. 
the De Jaggers who are, are you know, going across the country uh, raising money for poverty, um, and they're leaving in June and going all the way from uh, the West Coast to the East Coast on a bike. And, and I remember Henry saying, Tim, I don't know how we're going to raise $20,000. And he, he came into my office right when I got back, and, and Henry's not always, you know, he's not an outgoing, but he was like giddy, you know. He's like, Tim, 45% of that 20,000 came from this body, and we never even had an offering. It just came from people. And it shows me that, you know, God is moving, God is working. And, and we heard at council this week about, you know, our, uh, when we feed the homeless here, we have a, a food pantry here, and, 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 and the shelves will be full one week, and the next week they're all empty. And the deacons will say amazing things will happen, the people of God here will fill that up, and the next week it'll end, it's this wave going back and forth. I, I can't wait. I was at a church on sabbatical. It was so cool. Sunday after church, there was, uh, and Patty was with me, there was probably 200 people after church that were waiting to get bags of groceries. Isn't that awesome? I, I can't wait till we do that. I mean, we're, we're helping a lot of people, but man, wouldn't it be great on a Sunday, Brian, and, you know, and Danelle and, and Mario, if we just, we gave out groceries because we have, we have encountered this sovereign king. And, and here's our brothers and sisters in need in our community. And we can't keep it to ourselves. We got this king. He's huge. And we're going to help the poor and the needy, whether it's in Kenya or uh, South Africa or Lesotho or right around the block. And so, so this incredible worship, and they, they begin to just lay this stuff at Job's feet. just reminds me of Acts chapter 2. They laid all their money. They sold lands and property, and then they laid it at the feet of the apostles. And it said in Acts, it says, nobody had need in the community. Isn't that great? There was nobody who had need. Why? Because they centered their lives around the suffering Savior. They fellowshiped around Jesus. They broke bread around Jesus. They praised around Jesus. They, they worshiped around Jesus, and they gave to Jesus. And what happened, the community noticed this. And just like at Job's house, they started to gather. Who is this Jesus you're talking about? And why do you give your money away to the poor and the needy? And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. They didn't have an evangelism campaign. They didn't have, you know, stadiums full of people and evangelists. They just lived Jesus Christ. Not that, that those are good things too, but they lived Jesus Christ and God brought them together and they were able to share about a suffering servant raised from the dead. Incredible things happened this week. i just end with this story, but... Just, you know, miracles, uh, healing, relationship, people forgiving, people they've been bitter at for, for years. And, and one person came to me last week, and uh, can you put uh, Psalm 51 up there? And um, remember we did this, if you were here last week, we prayed this, prayed for people, prayed, we put their names in this. And I told you I had never heard of this before. Uh, but we were at our denominational prayer summit and this missionary from East Africa prayed this for the Muslims. Remember that? Or do you guys forget already? You guys remember? So we prayed this last week. And so this person came to me this week and opened their Bible to Psalm 51. And there was a date there. It was November 13, 2012. And this person had gone through just the horrific dark night of the soul. And literally, this person's world was just crumbling, crumbling, crumbling. And so he just started lamenting. And so he went to the Psalms where there's full of laments. And he came to Psalm 51. And God moved him to put the name of that person that really hurt him into this. And he, he prayed. And he's been praying nonstop Psalm 51. And... Um, God has heard the cries of his heart, and someday you'll get to hear, hopefully, the testimony of this family together. But, but he prayed, he blessed this situation, he forgave, just like Job did. And, and literally, this person would testify, if, if this person was standing before you, God restored the years the locust has taken away. 
God restored my home. God restored my household and joy and blessing and bounty and all to the glory of God. And, and he just prayed this prayer. And, and then somebody came to me this week after the um, Beth Moore deal and just said, you know, Pastor Tim, it would be really cool if we would pray this prayer before we have communion uh, the next Sunday. So I said, what a way to prepare us to come to the table, to a suffering uh, Savior, Jesus Christ, and have our hearts prepared by Psalm 51. And, and maybe you need to forgive yourself. Uh, maybe there's still somebody you're battling uh, forgiveness with. Uh, somebody uh, last week also came to me and said, you know, I was in the service last Sunday, in the first service, and um, thought the sermon was fine, it was good and all, but I, I didn't have anyone to forgive. So I thought I was good. And I went home, and that night my whole world fell apart. And I cried, and I wept, and I didn't sleep for three days. I just cried every night. But I knew that I had to forgive. And I sat in this, this meeting with these two people, and I saw the Holy Spirit come, and I saw God's grace as they forgave each other. And powerful reconciliation happened. So you may be here right now and things are great in your life. Marriage is great, things are great, but tomorrow or tonight, your whole world could fall upside down, turn upside down. And so um, stand with me and the praise team, if you will come and let me lead you through this and then we'll, we'll finish uh, with one more song. And just put the person or the, if it's yourself or if it's somebody else, as we prepare our hearts for a, a meeting with God, I just pray next week we're going to encounter God as we finish the book of Job and, and our hearts will be ready for uh, his work and his grace. So uh, just join me. Cleanse me or cleanse this person with hyssop and he will be clean. Wash him and he will be whiter than snow. Let him hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from him, from her, from their sins, and blot out his iniquity. Create in him a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within him. Do not cast him away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from him. Restore to him the joy of your salvation and grant him a willing spirit to sustain him or her. Notice how this ends. This is so cool. Then that person, that person's going to give a testimony. Then he or she will teach other transgressors, other sinners, your ways. They're going to be restored. They're going to teach Jesus Christ and grace and forgiveness. And sinners, listen to this. This is evangelism. And sinners will turn back to the king of glory, amen? It's right here, people. This is, this is God's way to restore, bring us back into relationship with him, in community, to have authentic community, no mask. And restoration happens where people are redeemed like Job's friends. And they tell the story of God's glory and sinners come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen? Keep praying this and let's come to the table uh, next Sunday full of gratitude and thanksgiving for a God who's died on the cross, rose from the dead, lives in our hearts, and reconciles us to the Father and to others. Amen.
team, if you could uh, come forward and uh, if you need prayer, you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, let us just share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, somebody said to me, uh, Coco, is, uh, I've never, is a fishing term, uh, you catch him and he cleans him? Is that right? <laughs> he cleans us, he changes us. So if, if God has caught your heart this morning and you need him to clean you and forgive you of your sins. Uh, people will be up here, and we love to pray for you. Or you need healing. I know we've seen some amazing healing this week. Um, it just takes the boldness to say, God, okay, I'm going to come, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and get some prayer. Um, you need something in your family, in your relationship. Let us, let us pray over you, okay? Um, amen. Um, after the service, good coffee. It's not our old church coffee anymore. <laughs> right, Danelle? It is good. They made it, it's not Starbucks, but they made it stronger and better and better flavor. So make sure to meet people. We want to be an authentic community and try to meet some people you don't know and just ask them about their lives and enter into their lives and their space and just see what God is doing there. So tonight we have a, another great teaching from the book of Jeremiah. Uh, so come at six. National Day of Prayer, I forgot to announce that in the first service. National Day of Prayer is this Thursday. So in Chino, we're going to be out at City Hall. Hour six is going to be leading us. Cra um, uh, what's your son's name? Kevin. <laughs> see, I told you I'm getting old. Um, Kevin in hour six will lead on City Hall, and uh, we're going to be praying uh, for our community and for our officials, so uh, please come out, 1145 there as well. Um, for your blessing uh, today, the Lord bless you, but just bless three other people. Say the love of Jesus Christ be with you, okay? God bless. Have a great day.